Okay. It says recording in progress. So we're, we're good to go. It is 6.03, so I think it's time to start. And I'd like to welcome everybody for coming out, no, not coming out, but uh, attending uh, this event. Uh, and I welcome uh, Professor David Zimmerman uh, and uh, for doing a presentation tonight. And uh, this is a presentation of the Border Historical Society here in Eastport, Maine. We uh, promote all sorts of historical events, including this Zoom series. Um, we also take care of some historic structures here in Eastport, and we would love to have you as a member. Send, send us a message if, if you want to join. It's uh, 10 Yankee dollars per year, I believe. It's, 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 a, it's a wicked bargain, you know? <laughs> as they say in Maine, right? So we, we'd, we'd love to have you do that. You can do that via PayPal. My name is Joshua Smith. I'm a professor at the United States Merchant Marine Academy and director of the American Merchant Marine Museum uh, and a longtime fan of Eastport history and a longtime fan of D David Zimmerman, as a matter of fact. I'm, I'm going to try and show you something. This is, this is my copy of David's book, um, which you can't really see there, but I have kept in it the receipt from the Border Historical Society dated August 1st, 1993. Boy, remember 1993? Was it, wasn't it a simpler, better world? We'd won the Cold War. <laughs> <laughs> I think everything was a little better, frankly. Um, but uh, it cost me uh, 20 for the set, along with the, the Beneath the Barracks book, it cost me $23.58, which um, I, I wasn't even a graduate student yet. I thought was a lot of money, but they sent it to me on credit. They trusted me for it. They sent the book and then I sent the check in. It says mail payment to Border Crafts, care of Midge Parker. I don't know Midge Parker, but I bet some, some of you do. So <laughs> um, I'm going to keep that in the book forever. And um, that uh, there, there, there's David's book again, the pan folding up. So uh, I'm especially pleased to introduce David because his book it influenced my historical studies. Uh, it it revealed to me that wow, all the details of Maine's history um, are available, and they can be found in archives, not just in the United States but in Canada and Britain. And in 2022, I'm publishing my own scholarly monograph on Maine and the War of 1812 called Making Maine, is what the, author, what the editor is calling it right now. So um, David, thank you for putting me on that 30 year trail to publishing this book. And um, yeah, you owe me about $20,000. <laughs> For all the research I've done. Oh, you're all me. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, thank you for the inspiration. Uh, and on that, oh, that, uh, I should say a little something about David's career. Um, David Zimmerman is professor of history at the University of Victoria, British Columbia in Canada. David was born in New York City, which is where I'm at essentially, and grew up in Toronto, Canada. He was educated at the University of Toronto and the University of New Brunswick, just across the border. His first book was Coastal Fort, A History of Fort Sullivan, Maine, which we'll be discussing tonight. And then his other works have dealt with various aspects of military technology, largely, it looks like to me, um, including Britain's shield, radar, and the defeat of the Luftwaffe, top secret exchange, the Tizard mission, and the scientific war, the Great Naval Battle of Ottawa, and Maritime Command Pacific, the Royal Canadian Navy in the Pacific during the early Cold War. He's published over 20 articles on various aspects of naval and military history and on academic refugees. His book, Ensnared Between Hitler and Stalin, Refugee Scientists in the USSR, will appear in 2022. And on that note, David, take it away. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's for me, 
I'm 33 years at the University of Victoria. And before that, of course, I had to do, this was my master's degree project. I went on to do a PhD at UNB in Fredericton. And I still look back at my time researching on the history of Fort Sullivan in Eastport as probably my fondest uh, memory of being a historian. And this all started, I believe, for me in the winter of 1982, uh, when I went, I was put in contact by the people at the Maine Historical Preservation Commission that there was an interest in someone to write a history of the Fort in Eastport. And it seemed to me that the people uh, from the state capitol actually didn't want to have to go to Eastport to do such a thing. So to find some crazy student in Fredericton who was interested was a bonus. And I agreed to meet the people from Eastport. And we agreed to meet in, a, in St. Andrews, just across the border, of course. And Ruth McGinnis and New French arrived in this house I was staying at with some friends. And they brought into the room the largest roll of documents, posters, maps, et cetera, I'd ever seen. They had gone to the National Archives in Washington and got them to reproduce every single uh, illustration of the fort that was in the National Archives. And they just handed it to me and say, here, start. And off I went. And that summer, I ended up researching in Eastport. And I have, again, this amazing memory of being, there was a bookstore that John Pike Grady, I hope I have that name right, had on Water Street. And he had, for some reason, John was a bit of a crazy eccentric. He had bought the microfilm reproduction of the Eastport Sentinel. And he bought a microfilm reader. And I was put up into the book store in the loft, spending entire summer reading every issue of the Eastport Sentinel that was available. And the really bizarre thing is that that bookstore, as far as I know, was never open. And throughout the entire summer, people came banging on the door trying to get in. And I just tried to ignore them as I continued with my work. But the result of this work, of course, was the history I wrote of the fort. And I hope you can now all see. Can you see my screen? Yes. You OK? And of course, it resulted in the publication a few years later of the book on, on Fort Sullivan, Coastal Fort. And it remains today my favorite, absolutely favorite book. Beautiful production, great illustrations. Um, it was a wonderful thing. And by the way, some of you were holding up copies earlier. I think the rare copies are the ones I didn't sign uh, because there was one day after the publication, I came down to Eastport from Fredericton and I signed just about every copy that had been produced. Um, and it was just a great, wonderful experience. But since I left New Brunswick, in 1987, I've actually only been back to Eastport once. And here I am, I came back in the early 2000s uh, to a conference in Fredericton and I drove down to Eastport for the day and here I am with the book at the remains of the powder magazine. And you know, I still every once in a while get queries from people about uh, my book, my work on Eastport. And in 20, I went to St. John's for a conference on the War of 1812. And one of the pleasant experiences I found at that conference was that my book had spawned a whole group of new scholarship in the history of the war in the East along the main New Brunswick frontier. Uh, and so I felt really quite pleased that my work had been met with such a wonderful reception uh, and still really is the building block for the modern study of uh, 
of this region in the War of 1812. And I'm so glad there's another book coming out now, which will broaden out the topic. And of course, the slide here is a slide from about 1900. And it shows you the powder magazine as it existed up to then, the remains and just like the cover of the book. So where am I now? Well, my whole life seems to be on islands. I was born on Long Island in Brooklyn. I, um, well, I, in Toronto, there isn't, an, I didn't grow up on an island, spent a lot of summers on Toronto Island and Toronto Harbor. But then when I went east to Fredericton, of course I went to Eastport, which people often forget because of its attachment to the mainland with a causeway is actually Moose Island. And uh, I live now on another island and I've spent most of my adult life on another island, but in a different ocean uh, on Vancouver Island. And this is Vancouver Island here. Um, I live down on the Southern tip in Victoria, the provincial capital. And down here, if you wanna orientate yourself is Seattle. So that's where I am. And I just put in this picture, this is the view I can see as I lecture to you across the street. Uh, Victoria is the tropical capital of Canada, and there's my neighbor's palm tree there to prove it. So anyway, I'm always fascinated by the fact that I'm coming back to this study. And I want to do just very briefly some context of the importance of thinking about coastal fortifications in terms of um, in terms of US military history. And of which, of course, Fort Sullivan is a small but important part of this history. It may seem extraordinary to um, those of us who grew up in the 20th or even now the 21st century, that the United States was once not a great military power. And in fact, the founding fathers of the country actually feared the existence of a large permanent army. And this is something they inherited from the British uh, and thus goes back to the tradition of militias or the National Guard. And the view of the federal government throughout much of the, well, all of the 18th century and into the 19th century was the centerpiece of American defenses should be fortifications. And the fortifications ranged from the very small and militarily insignificant, such as Fort Sullivan in Eastport. Here's a profile of the original fort uh, from 1820 showing the blockhouse. And here's a overhead view done very well showing the gun battery down into uh, the ocean up here. And it goes right through until the beginning of the 20th century, when you get into the fourth and fifth systems of enormous fortifications, which went around all over the American coast and of course into the American empire, a place like the Philippines. And this is a giant 12 inch disappearing gun, which is in Fort Warden in Port Townsend in Washington state, just across the water from where I live in Victoria, British Columbia. So the fort itself is really a part of American history. It's a crucial center part of American military history in the 19th century. And it was also uh, a part of the, one of the largest fortification programs ever undertaken by the American government. And certainly at the time, the largest civil engineering project ever undertaken by the American government and that was the so-called second system of fortifications. And while Fort Sullivan is one of the smaller forts, it was one of at least 46 coastal forts. There's some debate on how you count the second system forts and which extended from Louisiana uh, and around, but of course not yet including Florida. Uh, well, a little bit of Florida to Eastport and 11 of these 46 forts were in Maine. There are a few survivors. Uh, one survivor that's probably as close as we can get to Fort Sullivan, although the blockhouse 
doesn't look anything like the blockhouse at Fort Sullivan, uh, which was rectangular, is Fort Edgecombe down the coast from you. Uh, reason they're, they're quite different is none of these forts were standardized, particularly the smaller forts like Fort Sullivan were actually contracted to be built by local uh, people, uh, which I guess was, a, in this case was, in Fort Sullivan's case, was a Revolutionary War volunteer who did some construction, had some experience with civil engineering. So these small forts dotted the coast, and then there were much larger forts of masonry that protected the major places, the only one of which existed in the uh, areas around uh, Portland. Now, Fort Sullivan is mostly known for its crucial role it played in the years leading up to and then into the War of 1812. And I go into quite a bit of detail in the book about the events surrounding the Embargo Act of 1808 and how Eastport became the center of resistance to the power of the federal government and how the fort as constructed very quickly became, and it wasn't intended to be when it was built, a symbol of federal authority. Although the small garrison that was sent to the fort uh, could not in fact successfully prevent the rampant smuggling that was going on between the United States and British North America uh, with the Royal Navy in the waters off Eastport, there was very little they could really do. And in fact, the citizenry of Eastport basically rebelled against the federal government and in large measure locked the garrison up in the fort. Now, this is the drawing from my book, of uh, Fort Sullivan in 1812. I don't think it's terribly accurate. And one thing I have been able to add to this is I found down in Fort Moultrie, uh, which is in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, one of their explanation panels, they had this illustration of what a War of 1812 gun battery with 18 pounder guns and Fort Sullivan had four 18, four, four 18 pounder cannon. This is how they would have been mounted, not as in the drawing, which looks more like a, uh, a mobile or field artillery. This is the garrison gun on the right. Interestingly enough, just coincidentally, Fort Moultrie was originally, during the American Revolution, was named Fort Sullivan. Just a funny little thing there. But this crucial role, and of course, the capture of the fort uh, in 1814 by the British, uh, by no uh, less a figure than uh, Sir Thomas Hardy, who had been Nelson's flag captain at Trafalgar, the overwhelming might of the, of the British Army, which included an entire regiment of foot, plus artillery and engineers, plus the Marines on board the British ships, simply overwhelmed the tiny garrison at the fort. Unfortunately for the citizens of Eastport, as you know, the garrison surrendered without a shot being fired, and thus began the British four-year occupation of what they called Moose Island. They wouldn't accept the name Eastport because it was an American name, which they didn't recognize. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about anything more about the War of 1812, because I think the focus, and as I understand from talking to Pam Beveridge about what's been going on in Eastport, really, I think the focus of the historical activity has to be um, has to be um, on the garrison as it existed from 1818 to 1853. In my book, I called it the middle years. This was the years that Eastport really was basically a place to, uh, to base groups of soldiers when they were not needed for major military uh, conflicts. And in this period, between the War of 1812 and the American Civil War, uh, Fort Sullivan was usually housed between one or two companies of artillery, uh, between 50 and 100 soldiers uh, were based there, showing the flag, the sovereign flag of the United States, 
across the water to what was then British North America, the uh, crown colony of New Brunswick. And I was able to find this lovely little picture of, of uh, uniforms of this period. They're hard to find. Most people are interested in the American Civil War, but down in Florida, there are some reenactors who actually do one of the greatest of all the conflicts with indigenous populations, who's very, very important in this period. This is the Seminole Wars. And so this is what the basic uniforms of at least infantry soldiers would have looked like. My one criticism is all these guys are way too old to be soldiers. Uh, but they are the guys that can afford to buy the costume and buy the muskets to be reenactors. Um, the garrison at Fort Sullivan was in fact withdrawn during this period twice to fight in the two major conflicts, one being the said Seminole War, which went from July 1836 to August 1940. And that conflict is often forgotten, but it was probably the most uh, savage and long lasting of all of the major conflicts with indigenous tribes in American history. And as well then the Mexican American war that notorious war of conquest waged by the United States against uh, your neighbors to the south uh, which was fought between August 1945 and 1848 which resulted ultimately in the American uh, capture of Mexico City under the great American General Winfield Scott, and resulted ultimately in the annexation of huge areas of new territory to add to the growing American Republic. And the fort itself was finally abandoned in the last time prior to the Civil War in 1853, when soldiers were needed to garrison the new and emerging territory of California, fueled by the massive population explosion of the gold rush. Now, Fort Sullivan in this period was not terribly important to the defense of the nation. And I found this lovely account of Eastport from a traveler who reported back to a Boston newspaper in June of 1850. And this is what he wrote. The village of Eastport is crowned on its highest point by Fort Sullivan, the extreme Eastern fortification in the United States. It is at present under the charge of Colonel Burke, a connection by marriage, I believe, of the president, and at all events, a warm admirer of old Zach, Zachary Taylor. In a military point of view, part of little value is attached to these fortifications. Situated as Eastport is, surrounded by all sides by navigable water and by and exposed on all sides, an army of 10,000 men would hardly be adequate defense. And besides, nothing would be gained by retaining it beyond the spot itself. It is only kept up for appearance sake to display the flag of our country on the extreme frontiers. So this was an observer of, of Fort Sullivan in 1850. And this was a few years before the garrison was finally withdrawn to go to California. But it was a, more than a decade after the last of the guns in front of the blockhouse had been removed and put into storage. In fact, there was simply no military defenses left of the fort except a picket fence around it, which was more, I think, to keep the garrison in than to keep invaders out. Now, the reason I want to focus on this is I understand from my discussions uh, that the serious issue you're now facing as a society and as a city is what is going to be determined by one of the very, very last remnants of the fort. And this is what is the, you know, the barracks museum or more properly the North officer quarters. And uh, I did manage to find a, a picture of it, I think it's probably a few years ago. And uh, it was built in, originally this structure was built in 1822 by John Kelly, who was the camp settler. And settler was basically the merchant. He sold goods to um, soldiers that weren't provided by the army 
uh, things like tobacco, extra alcohol, if he was allowed, uh, clothing, blankets, et cetera. And the building was purchased by, from Kelly by the army in 1827. I suspect Kelly was probably quite happy to sell because the garrison was so small by 1827, he couldn't have made much of a business selling to the soldiers on the post. The fort, this building remained as part of the officer's quarters on Fort Sullivan until it was moved to its present location when the buildings of the fort were sold off in 1877. And I think the real significance of this building and it is, I believe, immensely historically important, is that it represents a typical military structure of the period between the War of 1812 and the Civil War. And this is why I'm focusing my talk on the importance of this structure and on in the antebellum period, as American historians tend to call this period, This is what the buildings look like when they're up on the fort. This is a diagram, uh, which is from the book, of the quarters from 1840. It's one of the earliest views we have of what things appeared up on the fort. And this is the commanding officers. Just give me one second. I'm just gonna change my ink color here and my pointer so it's more visible. This is the commanding officer's house as originally built, it was heavily modified after 1840. Quite a beautiful building in its later years. And then there are actually three officer quarters buildings of which the one that survived was here. There's another one that survived for many years, I believe on Orange Street, which has since gone. And then there's this section here. So the three sections of the officer's quarters which were connected over the years and then at least in the 1840s, connected probably by some sort of summer kitchen or some sort of kitchen to the commanding officer's house here. And this shows the details of what the building looks like in profile and interior. They're very detailed diagrams for anyone who hopes to do any rebuilding. And this picture here is from the 1870s. It's a picture I have in the background. This shows the three officers quarters here some route divided about like there. And this is, of course, the building that survives. Um, and it remains essentially unchanged from when it was first built all the way back in the 1820s. So a remarkable example of a survival of a military building of that period. But as I understand, the building has fallen on hard times. I don't know any of the details and I don't want to get into the a controversy about this, but a few pictures that were sent to me of the interior of the building. It looks really quite stunning, but of course you can see the obvious damage. And I know you folks are trying to raise funds uh, to save the building and to repurpose it uh, in the future. And I hope that you are successful because this building is so important. And what I want to do in the talk as I go on is to give you some other ideas of why this building is so important. Now in my book, I talk about the garrison of the fort as being really a ghetto, a self-contained community walled off from the rest of the town. And the relationship between the American professional army and civilians was quite complex in the antebellum period. The soldiers themselves, were considered, as the British General Wellington said, the scum of the earth, and very much outsiders and intruders not to be trusted, more likely to be criminals than honorable, certainly by the citizens of most towns where there are garrisons, including Eastport. On the other hand, the officers who commanded them were viewed as integral members of high society, and that I go into some detail in the book as well. The men, the soldiers under the control of their officers, the soldiers were pro provided a welcome security to the town. One example is they provided uh, a fire service, which hand in hand with the town's fire service, kept the town from burning down, which happened twice in the 19th century. As this picture here illustrates from the 18, is it 1864 fire, I believe. Um, and it's interesting to note the two times the town burned down in the 19th century, 
there was no garrison present. And the garrison not only provided a doubling of the fire service, but also provided an early warning system with a 24 hour guard at hand to ring bells and fire cannons if a fire was detected in town to wake everyone up. And certainly there's a lot to be done about the social history of soldiers. Um, I found a whole slew of ads showing what was required to maintain the garrison. Uh, this is a typical ad of the period and I've included as well Hancock Barracks and Holton, Maine, which during the border crisis between uh, New Brunswick and Maine was actually had more soldiers than Eastport did. But typically in the period between the wars, the garrison at Fort Sullivan needed 60 barrels of Boston number one pork, 125 barrels of fresh superfine flour, 55 bushels of good sound beans, et cetera, et cetera. And so one of the things about this, the fort was also part of the economy of this community. And everything that was spent at the fort, the vast majority of it was supplied by local merchants. But again, the soldiers were viewed with suspicion. And in 1829, in one of the very first acts of prohibition, the Maine State Legislature passed a law to forbid the sale of alcohol to federal soldiers. And this was targeted only could be at the garrison at Eastport and the garrison in Portland, because that's the only garrisons that were placed at that period in Maine, as far as I know. The members of the fort, they lived and they died at Fort Sullivan. So they're very intimately connected to the, to the community, even if they were walled off from it. There are some graves up in the, in the cemetery. I have found a couple online. This is a Private Michael Kennedy. Uh, on the, uh, who died on the 2nd of uh, February, 1853 here. And this is Corporal Jacob Sheeb who died in 1849. And so there are still these visible signs of the garrison's presence in the town. But as well, uh, one of the few national recordings out of Eastport in this period do recount the life and death of the soldiers at the fort. And this is an account from a newspaper in 1843, reporting the death of Goliath and Saunders, aged 10 years and seven days. Daughter and only child of Major H. Saunders, U.S. Army, who commanded the fort at the time. And so as most people experienced in this 19th century, the specter of sudden death was always upon uh, the people of Eastport and the garrison. So now I wanna to turn to what I really think is my main new approach to this topic. And what I've been able to do is because of the creation of digital sources, since that ancient time, as I tell my students when the dinosaurs still roamed, when I was a graduate student, uh, the digital information revolution has transformed the historical discipline. And it's really valuable to go back to old topics and see what else you can glean. And one of the things I've been able to gleam out of this, I always knew that most of the officers had graduated West Point. In fact, I believe now it's about 50%. And this is a typical cadet uniform of West Point in the period, not anyone that was on the fort. And one of the things is because most West Point graduates have left some historical footprint, which is now captured digitally, I've been able to track the lives of many of the soldiers many of the officers that lived uh, on the fort and possibly lived in the barracks. And while George Washington may not have slept in the officers' quarters, many famous soldiers of the great conflicts from 1818 to 1865 did. And so I wanna talk very quickly about what I call the notable and ignoble soldiers at Fort Sullivan. And this is actually these reenactors again, but this time they're in their artillery uniforms, exactly as would have been worn by soldiers in 
uh, at the fort in the 1820s and 1830s. Right now, with the research I've been able to do, the enlisted soldiers remain almost completely anonymous. And even many of the officers, including the fort's commanders, sometimes left little to mark themselves in the historical record. One example, although I think I may be changing this, is one of the longest serving commanders of Fort Sullivan in the period, Captain Brevet Major, and Brevet is a temporary honorary rank usually gained in war, Reginald or Reynold Kirby. And this is a news story from October, 1842, recounting Major Kirby's sudden death at Fort Sullivan. Now, apparently he was buried in Eastport. Uh, the online sources say there is some sort of stone to him in the cemetery. If anyone knows and can find it and send me a picture, I'd love to see it. It may very well be that it's since vanished. But Kirby was born, who died at the fort, and he commanded the fort from 1826 to 27, and again from, his, uh, from 1840 until his death in 1842. In between, he was involved in the Seminole Indian War. He was apparently a hero of the War of 1812, fighting at the siege of Fort Erie. Um, and I know from a uh, website called Find a Grave, uh, about him, he was born in Litchfield, Connecticut, who his uh, mother and father was. And that, of course, as I said, he died at Fort Sullivan after a brief illness. Now, I have just in the last couple of hours found that Kirby left a diary, which is in a university archive in the United States. And I'm going to get hold of it. I don't know what period it covers, whether it covers his period at Eastport, it would be a major development, if it does. Uh, part of the problem with Kirby is there seems to be some confusion about his first name. In uh, all the documents I read, his, his name, and including this obituary notice, his last name was Reginald. But apparently, he was known as Renold Kirby. And there's even uh, uh, an article appeared in a historical journal about him in the War of 1812 which I'm just now, I've just now ordered through interlibrary loan. So I'll see what happens with that. So let's look at some of the really notable soldiers, excuse me, that served at Fort Sullivan. And these are the sort of, as I say, George Washington didn't sleep here, but certainly Brigadier General Thomas Childs did. Now Childs may be obscure, but only because he didn't live long enough to fight in the Civil War. In fact, in this period, he was probably, prior to the Civil War, one of the most distinguished soldiers in the American army. And he commanded, and I just found the typo I was looking to correct, he commanded Fort Sullivan again twice from 1827, that should be 1835. And then again in July, June and July, 1836. He was a graduate of the West Point class of 1814. Uh, he only took him one year to get through the program, and he actually served in the frontier with Upper Canada or Ontario, uh, where he served with some distinction as a very young officer. He first comes to attention of high command uh, as a one of the principal American battlefield commanders in the Seminole Wars in Florida, but he really becomes famous in the Mexican-American War. And he's most famous for his defense of Jalapa or Yalapa. And this was a key uh, event of the Mexican-American War. Childs had been left behind by Winfield Scott to garrison this town near the coast while Win Winfield Scott's army marched without supplies into the heart of Mexico to take Mexico City. Childs was given only a force of 400 soldiers and his principal mission was to guard the coast, but also to protect 1,200 sick soldiers, sick soldier, soldiers left behind in hospital. When the Mexicans realized that Winfield Scott had gone into the interior, they attacked. And an army led by the great or infamous Mexican general Santa Ana and dictator, of course, a force of some 8,000 soldiers besieged the town. Child's force held up 
Every sick soldier that could hold a musket was called into service. And Childs withstood a 28 day siege against the Mexican forces, also preserving Winfield Scott's army. For doing this, he was breveted Brigadier General. And we have here a daguerreotype picture of him, one of the very first photographs, one of the few photographs of a soldier, uh, probably taken just before his death uh, in, the, in 1853. He died when he was sent back to Florida to serve in a coastal fortification. He died of yellow fever, the fate of so many soldiers who served in Florida in the 19th century. Another notable soldier who served at Eastport in Fort Sullivan, and I love these 19th century names, Major General Napoleon Buford. He was in the class of 1827 at West Point, and he served for four years or almost five years in the garrison at Fort Sullivan. He resigned from the army after leaving Eastport and became a successful businessman. That was, by the way, very common, particularly for uh, West Point graduates from the North they found they could make much, much more money in civilian life and business or in engineering than they could in the army. But he rejoined the army in 1861, where he led troops in the Western theater, including the famous battle of Island Number 10, a great Canadian, a uh, great Confederate fortress. And he fought in the siege of Corinth and finally the great siege of Vicksburg. For his service, he was made a brevet major general for his work in the Civil War. Perhaps the most important Civil War general, at least from the Union side, to have served in Eastport, is this man, George Green. He's a fascinating character. His life spans virtually the entire 19th century, dying at the age of 98. He was second in his class of 1823 at West Point. He, in fact, was so well regarded academically, he stayed behind to teach at West Point, and amongst his students was no less than Robert E. Lee. In 1833, uh, Green was assigned to Fort Sullivan, where he moved with his wife and three children. But unfortunately, shortly after arrival, within a space of seven months, all three of his children and his wife succumbed to illness. One source says it was tuberculosis. I'm not sure what the evidence is for that, but certainly he ended up being a widower, but also having to bury all of his children. The result of this personal disaster was that Green left the army and became a prominent civil engineer, building railways, sewer systems, water systems throughout uh, the United States. And he became one of the 12 founders of the American Society of Civil Engineers and Architects. Green remarried after he left the army and had six more children. So he did ultimately have a second family, a not uncommon phenomena for men in the 19th century when so many women succumbed, particularly to child in childbirth. Green rejoined the army in 1861 at the ripe old age of 60. He was one of the oldest generals in the Union Army when he rejoined. And he served with great distinction in that conflict. He led brigades and divisions in numerous battles, including Cedar Mountain, Antietam, and Fredericksburg. But he's most famous for the, his work, his conduct in the Battle of Gettysburg where he was responsible for organizing the defenses and building fortification to defend the right flank of the entire Union Army on Culp's Hill. And his defenses, although he himself was only second in command, the defenses he built against the orders of his commanding officer prevented the Confederates from outflanking the Union Army on the crucial day, first, second day of the battle. Here is, in fact, here the statue to Green on the Gettysburg battlefield site. And here is a memorial plaque to Green erected in the state capitol in Providence, Rhode Island, to commemorate his dis 
his distinguished service. And so Green, you know, is, is just one of these very, very important figures who plays a crucial role in the most important battle fought by the, in, in the American Civil War. So really important figure, and he may very well lived in this barracks building. Now, here's one of my favorites, and not one of these great 19th century names, Napoleon Jackson Tecumseh Dana. Now, he didn't serve at Fort Sullivan. He was born there. His father was a military officer who served, was serving in 1822 at Fort Sullivan when Napoleon was born. His father died in 1833, still a comparatively junior officer. Uh, and Dana was made a student at West Point because he had been orphaned when his father had died. And he graduated just before the Mexican-American War in 1842. He served with great distinction at the Battle of Monterey, the Siege of Veracruz, and the Battle of Cerro Gordo in that conflict. He was severely wounded, and after a time, he decided in 1855 to resign from the army to pursue a physically less demanding life uh, of the civilian businessman. However, Dana was not done with the army. He rejoined the Union forces in 1861 and saw numerous actions. In fact, he was severely wounded at, at Antietam and he later, after recovering from his wounds, played a prominent role in taking of the Texas Gulf Coast. And this is an article here uh, of, about Dana's appointment as Major General in 1863. Now, unfortunately, the Eastport Sentinel hasn't been digitalized. So I wasn't able to get back into it. It was probably in the Sentinel, the same announcement. But what this announces is Dana's appointment as being another main Major General because of his birth at Eastport. So again, a very important figure with close ties to this building, which you're trying to preserve. Well, I'm afraid they can't all be good. There is one certainly notorious person who lived in at Fort Sullivan. And this man here, Brigadier General John Winder. He was with the West, quote, West Point class of 1820. And he was actually the commander of Fort Sullivan briefly from 1842 to 1843. So he probably didn't live in the barracks building itself, but in the, off, in the commanding officer's house, which no longer survives. He had distinguished service, if you can call it that, in the Mexican War, including a leading role in the storming of, oh, now I'm gonna get this wrong, Chapultepec in September 13, 1847. This was the Mexican Military Academy where a group of cadets, very young men, some as young as 15, tried to prevent the Americans from taking their school. And Winder played a prominent role in the storming of the school, which including the bayoneting to death of many of these young uh, cadets. And today in Mexico, this is remembered as a heroic, um, as, a, as an heroic um, act by those cadets who were murdered. And they are referred to as the Ninos Heroes. My wife's gonna kill me who speaks Spanish fluently for that pronunciation. He was also at the capture of Mexico City. In 1861, Winder was one of the first Union office, uh, federal officers to resign from the Union Army, and he very quickly joins the Confederacy. He was a Southerner by birth. He became one of the most notorious Confederate officers. So not only did he do a notorious act in the Mexican-American War, but he became notorious, at least from the Union perspective, in the Civil War. He was made responsible for internal security, particularly around the Confederate capital of Richmond, but he later commanded all the POW camps, prisoner of war camps, including the notorious Andersonville camp. In fact, Winder is a character 
in the great novel that appeared, I believe, in the 1960s called Andersonville. And he's one of the considered to be one of the people that truly took great delight of, of allowing Union prisoners to die. And while there's some people defended Winder, saying that, in fact, he did his best uh, in a time when there was very little food in the Confederacy, he is said to have boasted, according to one eyewitness, that he was killing off more Yankees than 20 regiments in Lee's army, as if it was something to be proud of. So John Winder, again, his association with Eastbourne. So this is just the brief list of people I found, which I think are people you might want to think about recognizing if you do get to rebuild the officers' quarters. Because these people lived here, uh, they served the US faithfully and well, although we can argue about winter. And certainly, people are cor correcting my pronunciation. I can see in the chat, thank you. I needed that. Um, but, you know, we have to remember that if this building goes, you know, with the exception of what's left of the British powder magazine, there won't be much left. Let me read you from an account I found, again, of another visitor from Meeks Port in the years after the fort was abandoned by the U.S. Army in 1874. Eastport reposes in peaceful loveliness on the waters of Pasmaquoddy Bay and is in itself the beau ideal of a primitive New England seaport, which nevertheless affords very pleasant and cultivated society. The streets with their cool avenues of branching elms climbs gently from the water's edge. Most of the houses in the upper part of the town standing detached and bowered in greenery. Fort Sullivan is, still keeps watch and ward over the now peaceful scene, but stands dismantled of its warlike panoply. The unlimbered guns and tenantless barracks speaking of the days as, as gone by, when it may be an enemy fleet's came yonder round the hill, and the rushing battle bolt sang from the three-decker out of the foam. Definitely bad poetry, uh, but I needed to quote that completely. So finally, to my last slide, I think if the officer quarters is not preserved, it'll be the end, really, of this incredible connection to esports past. And I want to read you from one last newspaper account. This is from the Bangor Daily Wig and Courier, February 21st, 1877. And it reads thusly, the old blockhouse of Fort Sullivan is no more. One of the oldest landmarks that Eastport had has been leveled to the ground. As it, would, as it was no particular ornament and no earthly use at present, it is perhaps as well that it should come down. The old blockhouse was probably the first building erected on Fort Sullivan. As near as we can learn, it was built about 1807. Most of the timber taken from it is as sound as when put there and will be used for building purposes. The building was used as a guardhouse by the regiment or by the regular troops, and doubtless many of them were familiar with every nook and corner of it. The portholes or rifle holes on the sides of the building were more subjective of a stronghold for repelling Indian attacks than for any other use. And so even back in 1877, there's this feeling, you know, that we're losing something as these buildings are torn down. And now we're really at the end of that. And I really hope that, uh, that this building can be saved and repurposed I'm not gonna to try to suggest to you what you should do with it, but I hope in my talk, I've now given you some suggestion of how uh, you can think about this building and its historical significance, not perhaps as a remnant of the War of 1812, which it is not, but as a remnant of the antebellum United States Army. And to think about all those people who lived there and died there, and in some cases were also born there. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Wow. Uh, th th thank you, David. Uh, I see there have been some comments posted, but uh, the, the floor is open for questions. Feel free to unmute and ask David directly, so long as we, we maintain good order. Uh, does anybody have any questions for David? Well, I don't know what the Postmaster General is called in Canada, but David delivers. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. In, in Canada, it's an independent crown corporation. <laughs> so it's called the president of the of Canada Post. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I will say I'm, I'm so pleased that David's continuing his research and he's right. There is all, all sorts of stuff out there now available online that, that didn't used to be. So uh, um, David, I hope you're gonna publish some of that stuff when you come to some new, new conclusions. Well, I, I may, I mean, it's, it's what I can find online and I'm afraid, I mean, right at the moment, I can't really travel to the United States, I could, because I have my American passport, so they can't keep me out. Uh, but um, it's actually getting back into Canada that's complicated. They have to figure out a way to get a COVID test before I come back, 72 hours before I come back. And I also would have to leave my wife behind, which she would not be very happy about since she's not an American uh, citizen. So uh, I don't know how much of this uh, research I'm gonna continue, but I'm certainly gonna pursue getting uh, Major Kirby's diary now that I know it exists. I suspect, and I only suspect, it just covers his service in the War of 1812, but it might cover the time he's at Fort Sullivan. And you never can tell with diaries. They're either great or they're useless. And uh, I'll just have to wait and see. And hopefully this university won't uh, object to uh, uh, digitalizing it for me and sending it to me or photocopying or whatever because I'm not going to North Carolina to read this thing. <laughs> That's a bit much. <laughs> I, I, I have a fun account that I found in Harvard Business School of an officer at Eastport in the 1820s. And my, my research stops at 1820, boom, boom right? And it, it does, goes no further. So I'll, I'll try and send that to you. He apparently was an officer at Fort Sullivan and he ran away with a young lady of, um, Ill repute, <laughs> um, and we're, we're quite scandalized. When when was this? Oh, I I I, I want to say eighteen twenties, um, but I, I I'm sure I can find your email and I'll I'll send that reference to you. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, there's some things I just couldn't fit into the talk. And for instance, I found a number of accounts of there are some pretty nasty court martials took place of garrison of the. Uh, one of the garrison, one of which I mentioned in the book. Uh, someone asked me the name I see here in the chat of, of, of uh, Dana's father, the, the officer. It's in the book. I don't know if it's on my... Um, it was in that article that you showed, the newspaper, NG, maybe? Initial oh, in the NG. Captain NG Dana, but his full name is in the, um, I believe is in the book. <clears throat> I believe. Uh, and he's actually, I have a little bit more information about the father as well, but he died quite young. Um, and as I said, as a result, his son was given an appointment, uh, a non-state appointment to West Point. Josh who, or, or David, who was the general that came to accept Eastport back into the U.S.? Oh my goodness. Um, you know, I don't he, remember which he was famous, was. wasn't I think he was famous. And then maybe Bob Dallison can help the general who came to Eastport during the Fenian uprising. Well, that was General Meade. Ah, okay. General Meade, of course, the victor at Gettysburg came up. There's one interesting one I, I was gonna mention, but he back, as far as I know, never was at Eastport, although he was technically stationed at Eastport. Uh, I mentioned him this in the book, was uh, William Tecumseh Sherman. Wow. And Sherman was attached to the garrison, but he was then seconded back to Washington uh, 
army headquarters. And as far as I know, he never, as far as I know, he was never at uh, Fort Sullivan. After the Civil War, it was his orders that shut the fort down. So, you know, an interesting little connection there. But then again, they closed a lot of obsolete posts uh, in that period. Uh, you know, it's a very difficult, and as you know, even to this day, politically difficult thing for to close military posts. And they develop all sorts of apolitical ways. And but it's the same in Canada to, you know, to close a, a big provider to the economy. And in your, in your case, you, of course, have your, the whole uh, veterans uh, medical system as well, which is a big issue for people. We don't have the same thing in Canada, uh, but shutting down obsolete posts. And in many ways, you could say that Fort Sullivan should have been shut down in 1818, the day it was handed back over. Uh, but it lingered on and continued on. And again, what I say and talk about in the book of the importance of these officers to Eastport society, um, you know, you know, something to really think about. And, the first, I was reading the first account of fireworks in Eastport were done by these artillerymen who had, of course, the technical knowledge to launch up uh, fireworks. And that was a 4th of July tradition that they started. The 4th of July became a major holiday in the United States only in the years after the War of 1812. Hmm. Any other anyway, questions? Let's... Go ahead. I don't know if there's any other questions. Well, I. I, I, I... I will tell you, David, from, from my own research, I've struggled with the, the configuration of how the artillery was mounted. Yeah. And, uh, I have, uh, and I, 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 I messed up with, I did a little book on Fort Edgecombe and I assumed it was going to be mounted in the way that you pictured with the, the fort down, down south. Um, but uh, I've, I've since discovered, I, th I think in a, in, a, in, a, in a diagram of the fort, that they were actually on traveling carriages, what looks like what we many people call field carriages. Yeah, and uh, I, I would, you know, it's possible that's the case, but my understanding was that this, and I, I did do a bit more research on this illustration, oops, this illustration here, and I'll just share my screen again. Um, This illustration is, in fact, what it's most likely to have been. Uh, it's possible they were just using their, their guns. The problem was field guns of the period weren't 18 pounders. And we know that 18 pounders were, were at the fort. And I don't know that they had the standard artillery, uh, you know, limbers were guns as big as 18 pounders. That was a coast artillery piece and it would have mounted on these sliding uh, gun mounts to which to help absorb the recoil from such large guns. And there would have been ropes attached uh, I, I, back I, up to the wall. I, I've got uh, diagrams written at, written, uh, drawn at the time of Fort Mm, not Fort Preble, but, but, but Fort Scammell and Portland Harbor, and I think of Fort Sullivan as well. And they weren't called field carriages, they were called Aubrey's doing field hockey. And uh, Aubrey's doing field hockey. Oh, uh, somebody's uh, mic is on, I think. Yeah, somebody's mic is on. But, oh. but anyways, um, so, so these. The, I think he'd like that. The, the battery at Fort Sullivan was actually- You have to go around hitting people, basically. Uh, Amanda, I think you need to mute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, so the, the battery at Fort Sullivan was not very well constructed. And when they did fire the cannons, there are accounts from the War of 1812 where um, these terrible traveling carriages bounced right off the platform. Mm -hmm. and, and we know that because it crushed a soldier's leg and mm -hmm. he applied for a pension. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, I'd, be, I'd be interested to see that. And, and you know, I'm not going to disagree with you. As I say, uh, in those early days in my research, um, I didn't come across that. Uh, certainly, you know, the guns, that would have been a pretty big gun. And this might have said something about the um, about the US Army in the period, which wasn't, in fact, one of the best armies in the world at that time, I'm afraid. And particularly when you look at its uh, performance in the War of 1812, I mean, eventually it got better, uh, but the defeats that Britain felt faced through much of, uh, sorry, the American army encountered in places like Detroit, Queenston Heights, et cetera, early on in the conflict uh, were pretty indicative of the fact that the U.S. Army really wasn't a professional force. And of course, then again, there was a lack of cooperation with the militia. But let's not get into refighting the War of 1812. <laughs> um, I, I've talked too much. Uh, does anybody else have anything to add? Maybe Bob up, up there in Fredericton? He's got to unmute. Am I, am I correct in thinking the infamous uh, Union general by the name of Hooker also served in Eastport? It could be. Um, I'm trying to remember if uh, if Fighting Joe uh, met my list. I had a few other generals that I, I took out of the presentation. I don't think Hooker was one of the ones I, I picked up on, but I'll take a look and see. His signature, appear, his signature appears in one of the documents uh, dealing with the um, garrison there. It could be. It could be Joe Hooker, one of the less capable Union generals. Uh, well, Jefferson Davis, hmm? Jefferson Davis spent time in Maine. He helped on the baseline. The, um, yes. And he might have stopped off at Fort Sullivan. He might have. He, I have no evidence, but I have to go and look at, uh, right now, there now is available online through Ancestry.com for all the uh, monthly return of the fort. And unfortunately, I really just didn't have time to read them because it's in handwriting. It takes a long time to work it out. So I want to look at those again. Uh, and... Uh, Maybe I'll get a more extensive list of the soul of the officers that served at Fort Sullivan. I did appreciate uh, your genealogical tidbits. Well, I, I just think it's fascinating because we tend to forget that these were real people that lived up yeah. there. And that, as I say, if you folks can't preserve this uh, officer quarters, you're losing this really important historical connection to this period. And that would be a real tragedy. And I think it's something that should be on, uh, if it's not, on some sort of National Historic Register. I don't know if there's any funds It is available. on the National Register. Is, yeah. is there yeah. no funds available that, through Washington? That is not the guarantee of help that it sound, it's more prestige than anything. Mm. Well, it would, be, it would be a real tragedy because you've lost pretty much everything else. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know what happened to the artifacts that we excavated during the two digs. I don't know if they remained in Eastport uh, because I wasn't actually, although I pretty much ran the digs, I wasn't allowed to be in charge of the dig. And I didn't, of course, do the write-up of the material. But we certainly found some interesting artifacts of that period, uh, buttons, uh, plates, uh, et cetera. Uh, I think that they all went to the Maine Historic Preservation Commission, but I'm not sure. Uh, Neil DePauly, uh, if he's around, I heard that he worked for the Maine Historic Preservation Commission. He might know, uh, but certainly, you know, there's some, again, other important links uh, for that building to this period uh, when it was in service. Okay. Well, it, it sounds like we've come, come to an end of our uh, remarks. Uh, thank you for everybody for attending. And again, we'd love to have you as a member of the Border Historical Society for a mere 10 Yankee dollars per year.
uh, and check in with us on our Facebook page. We have presentations every month uh, and uh, we're getting pr pretty good crowds for those. I'm, I'm very pleased with that. So uh, on that note, um, you all uh, can enjoy the rest of your day. Um, David, if you hold on a second, I can show you a couple things. And Bob, if you want to stick around too, uh, that, that it might be fun to chat. So uh, everybody else, uh, have, have a good night and uh, we'll see you next month.